hey, everyone, thanks for coming. I think this is probably like the most bland topic possibly in security directly after lunch. Uh, so, so thank you for being here. Um, as Rob mentioned, my name is Greg Anderson. I'm a senior security engineer at Pearson. I'm also the, the creator of Defect Dojo. I was the, the San Antonio, or I was a San Antonio chapter leader for um, about two years. And um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not big on bios and you know, no one cares, just a bunch of boring stuff. Um, so I wanna start out by saying that I'm not a big fan of new tools, especially in security. I feel that every day someone is pinging me about something new that under promises and doesn't deliver. It either doesn't work, it's not easy to use, you know, whatever it is, I, I waste a lot of time listening to things about new tools that uh, don't actually seem to benefit me. And so I hope that this will be the exception. So uh, why did we create a new tool? Uh, basically, the idea was is we wanted to create a platform that allowed security engineers to focus on what you hired them for, which is hacking, as opposed to writing reports, gathering metrics, and, and doing analytics. And uh, it's also a tool created by security professionals for security professionals. And the, the only reason that I mention that is I feel as security becomes more integrated with the software development lifecycle, we frequently get pushed into tools that don't really make sense for security. So if you're working out of like a Jira Sprint board, you know that's pretty awful, um, et cetera. Do we have any Jira Sprint board users here? Yes, I had to deal with that too, and oh man. Anyways, drove me insane. Uh, it's also about getting the most out of your program because at least a, a challenge that I have is finding A, the talent in the industry with the, the budget that I have. So either you can't find the talent or your budget is not scaling with the attack surface area. And so I think as an industry, we have to figure out a way to get smarter about how we test. And so the kind of the obvious answer to that is, is automation. But automation and security has kind of traditionally been a dirty topic because Six years ago, automation meant that you were only skimming the surface and, and doing 20% of, or finding 20% of what was actually possible rather than doing, you know, like a, a total manual deep dive. So the other thing that, that I wanna mention is I've seen a lot of great talks uh, over the years and something that, that bothers me in presentations is people give like this amazing presentation about this new process or this new thing that's gonna make everything better and then they don't like give me any data or like anything really compelling to actually like go out and, and try something new. So uh, Pearson has been gracious enough to let me share like the data we've collected in, in the past three years. So in 2014, we had give or take like 12 staff members that we were utilizing for testing and we did 44 assessments, which is terrible, right? Like that, those are the kind of numbers you get like in trouble and get chewed out over. Uh, and, and it wasn't because the team or the, the skill level, we had an excellent team. The issue was more that there was so much red tape at Pearson. And at the time, they were very focused on doing everything as thorough as possible. So essentially leaving no stone unturned in your testing. And um, in 2015, Pearson adopted the, the principles of what is called the, the AppSec pipeline or uh, secure DevOps, rugged DevOps. Are, are you guys familiar with this term? Yeah, yeah, probably if you're in this track, you're at least semi-familiar with the principles. Um, oh yeah, and then in 2016, we switched to Defect Dojo and we went from 224 assessments in 2015, which was already a 450% increase, to 414 assessments with 107% increase. And the, the other thing that I wanna mention is our team has shrunk while this has happened, shrunk very drastically. Um, I'm actually the, the last application security engineer in Pearson, and it's a, a company of 40,000 that operates in every country of the world but two. So uh, it's, it's challenging, and, and frankly, without this, I would not be able to, to do my job effectively. But so the, the total is an 840% increase, and I don't attribute all of this to Defect Dojo. I think, if anything, the, the last increase is, is mostly attributed to it. But um, again, it's, it's about adopting those principles to make security more efficient and automate security like our, our QA and, and DevOps counterparts are doing. 
And so I am definitely like not the leading expert on that. When I think of great presentations on, on security automation and, and DevOps and security specifically, or security and DevOps, um, I think of like Matt Tesoro's talk. This is one of Aaron Weaver's slides that he let me borrow, uh, Shannon Leet's. And so I don't want you to get like hung up on this slide and like what all the color coding means and all that stuff. Um, it's a great slide for reference if you're new to this and you want to go back and try and build this into your program. I think the slide that's more interesting is actually seeing what our pipeline looks like. And so the big concept here is we have an intake process. And, and once that intake process is completed, we know exactly what testing needs to be uh, done on a given product. From there, using security orchestration and automation, we queue up the two tools necessary to actually go out and test. And so you can see the, these are the tools we're currently automating with. And then finally, the results of those tools are added into Defect Dojo for analysis, false positive removal, uh, and, and overall combining of the results and, and um, gathering metrics. This is a, another slide just kind of showing how the DevOps pipeline has parity with the AppSec pipeline. We think about AppSec in the DevOps pipeline after integration testing or when you do like your second round of, of load testing essentially. But again, like not a slide to get hung up on, just if you're going back through the slides later, it's, it's a great sort of reference to the overall architecture. Uh, probably a, a better example just for the, the sake of the presentation is when you think about testing in DevOps, you typically have your code stored in GitHub and you're using some sort of uh, deployment language, whether it's Ansible, Puppet, or, or something else through Jenkins. And what you want to do is copy that methodology for your AppSec tools. So have the ability to deploy your AppSec tools in the same ways that you are deploying your test environments for your products. So what do you do now, like today? Let's say you have the results of a Nessus scan and like the results of Zap Proxy. And anyone who's willing to answer, I will give stickers. Who wants stickers? Anyone? Anyone brave? Yes. Would you, would you mind stepping up to the microphone so everyone can hear you? Thanks so much. So, so today, what we do, um, we take Nessus and you know our application, our equivalent to Zap Proxy and stuff like that. Take the results from all of those. We throw them into Dratus. And then we take the results from Dratus. We can't really work with Dratus. We work with Dratus from an API perspective. We wrote our own custom solutions that take, um, that do scoring and a number of different things as it's going into Dratus and working with Dratus API. And then we flip that out to a notification process that's also custom.net code that spits it to Jira and uh, Landesk and other systems based on the scoring that we've done to direct it to the right teams for that, remediation. That sounds like a ton of work. You yeah. definitely earned some stickers. But that was a great answer. Is anyone else willing to share for stickers? Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah, I definitely want a sticker. So what we're doing is we have Security Center will hook into Jira. Uh, we have Zap going from Jenkins into Defect Dojo. And then we're outputting that in the Jira as well. Wait, so you use Defect Dojo right now? Yes. Man, that's cheating, right? Like th <laughs> that's my next slide. Anyone else? Any brave individuals? Yes. This is going very well for after lunch. Manually review the results. Manually create bugs. My man, you are brave. <laughs> so actually, that, that's typically the, the most common answer that I hear in, back in Texas is Excel. Which, like, I mean, that's, that's fine, right, if you want to do that. But that means someone's entire job is to maintain, like, the source of truth and combine the results of, of all the tools that you're using. You're dedicating at least one entire recess to doing that, and probably a very expensive resource. Um, and also, that doesn't scale, right? Like, as your company grows and the product line grows, it's, it's, it's lunacy to me. But um, the, the end goal that we're working towards with Defect Dojo is essentially a mothership for security tools. And so we have the ability to combine the results from all these tools into Defect Dojo. But what we, the, the, the big pie in the sky end, uh, end game goal is to produce a report with high confidence uh, with absolutely no human interaction based on analysis, comparing tools, and, and a couple other tricks we've come up with. 
So yeah, just like someone said, vulnerability management for me started in Dratus 2.0. And Dratus is a, is a good tool. Um, it can be difficult to work with, kind of as the, the gentleman mentioned, when you're working with their templating language to actually create reports and combine results. And so um, I was in a meeting with my leadership team and, and our VP was there. And we were discussing sort of the problems we were having in AppSec around our tooling. And so we, we tried a, a variety of commercial products because our, our split was that 60% of our time was done um, doing reports and generating metrics rather than actually testing, which, which is a lot. Um, and we didn't really find a commercial product that, that fit our needs. So um, I was fresh out of college out of the time and I hadn't really learned how to keep my mouth shut yet. And so I'm in this meeting and I said to my boss, Jim, I was like, Jim, if you gave me the chance, I think I could write something better. And probably because he was tired of dealing with me and listening to me, he said yes. So I was given two weeks to write the first version of Defect Dojo, and I hope you agree that if you're familiar with software development, two weeks is not a lot of time to get anything done. But uh, what came out of those two weeks, my, my boss actually really liked, so I was given a second developer whose name was Charles Neal, and we went into production with Defect Dojo just one month after we initially created it. And uh, to be honest with you, it was a nightmare. We had all sorts of metrics problems around uh, months that didn't have like 30 days. And so things were being double counted, and I was getting yelled at a lot, rightfully so. And, um, and yeah, but what came out of it was something that I, I couldn't do my job, job today without. At this point, it's, it's very, very polished. It's in production uh, in a, a lot of very large companies. We have over 20 contributors. But we also wanted to have certain pillars that would always be true in Defect Dojo because I had wanted to work in open source and contribute to open source before, but I found often the barrier of entry was too high. Either I had to spend days actually learning their code to go make a one-line change, or they didn't have documentation or something flat out didn't work. And so the first thing we wanted to make sure was always true was that we had great documentation. And so what that means is we typically don't accept a pull request unless it also has the, the documentation on that new feature. And that's not to be discouraging to the community. I think we have a, a very, very welcoming group for people that are just getting familiar and want to contribute or are new to Python. Uh, but that's one of the things we always wanted to hold true for the community because uh, for people that are using it in production, we really feel like we owed that to them. Launch easily, so it has a standalone script. It, it's just one command, and it works on every operating system except for Windows and BSD, with the exception of OSX. So you can get a test environment up on OSX. We were supporting Docker for a while, but everyone got busy. So right now our Docker image isn't that great, and I wouldn't recommend it. But um, but yeah, and also guys, if you have any questions throughout, I know Rob mentioned this at the beginning. Like, please feel free to like just stand up and, and shout in the mic. Uh, the other thing is Defect Dojo is built in Python Django. And the reason that we chose that framework specifically is because it's so easy to, to modify and, and make your own. Uh, even the most complex features in Defect Dojo boil down to essentially three files. And so the first one is models, which defines your database schema and how the data is actually stored. And then the, the next one is, is views, which defines like how you process your data, essentially, or what you're doing with it. it it's what actually uh, manipulates and, and has most of the code. And then finally, there's this concept of templates, which is what the user actually sees. That's the, that's the front end, that's the user interface. So to give you guys, though, a better example of, of how all this, all this actually works, uh, let's say that we all work at Google, just because I think everyone is very familiar with Google's product line. And uh, at the highest level, oh, and we're also testing Google Docs. So at the highest level in Defect Dojo, there's this notion of a product type, which is an organization or product line. And in Google's case, for Google Docs, would be Google Suite. And then uh, product types have a product, which is the application or, or product that you're going to be testing. And in our case, this would be Google Docs. Products have engagements, which is the assessment or, or mission of your testing. So it could be 
a PCI audit, it could be a manual deep dive, it could be an automated test. Oh, well, oops. And so uh, engagements have tests, which is the tool that you're actually going to be using. So we might use Nessus to do a PCI audit. Uh, tests have findings, which is what you actually found. And finally, findings have endpoints, so we can do all sorts of analytics on uh, the, the attack surface area, essentially. So right now, these are all the scanners we support. And this is actually not totally up to date because this morning I got a pull request for, for OpenVAST that I haven't had a chance to review. But um, if you see a tool, or if you don't see a tool, if you do not see a tool that you use, um, it, it's super easy to add. It actually just boils down to, to one file, so, so please don't be discouraged if you're like, I use Fortify, or you know, I use whatever, and I don't see it up there. And so how you actually do that is you have two options. The first is to look at one that like, someone has already written. So for instance, this is like our Nessus parser. It's about 200 lines, which if you're not very into software development, 200 lines might be a little daunting. Uh, to, if, if you're going to take this and port it to a new tool, you might have to write, I know that's hard to read, uh, you might have to write about like 60 lines of your own code. Or, my favorite way, is to look on Google for someone that has already written something in Python to, to work with the tool. So recently, Pearson wanted me to add Qualys to Defect Dojo. And so I went to Google, and I searched for Python tools, or Python libraries that would parse Qualys. The very first hit was a uh, script by someone of the name of John Kim, and I was able to adapt that thanks to John's work, who he licensed it under the MIT license, which is compatible with ours. So I took his code, figured out what he was doing, and in the end, I only actually had to add about 20 lines. So all I changed was I mapped like his scoring, so his Qualys importer was using CVS scoring, and uh, I needed to convert it to essentially high, medium, low. And then right here, I actually just created a new finding and saved it. That's it. And so Pearson was really, really excited about this feature. Like of all the things that I've worked on, like they were really excited about this one. And honestly, it probably took me like the shortest amount of time. Let me get this back. Uh, so we have like metadata fields and also, so which is like a two-dimensional custom field, if that makes sense. So you can specify, oops. I think it just started playing, sorry guys. Oh, so we don't support it on the actual finding level, so I'm not sure that would work. We do it for products, but, but it wouldn't be hard to add. I'm gonna figure, oh, there it is. I always f forget where the button is. Oh, and then of course, I'm going to demo after this. Okay, so um, I'm about to actually like show you guys in, in, in action. Um, the one thing I, I will say about live demos, if, if you do any sort of presenting yourself, is that uh, the golden rule of presenting is do not do a live demo because something always goes wrong. And I'm about to do like 15 to 20 minutes of live demo, so We'll see how it goes, I guess. <laughs> yeah, if everything goes well, stickers for everyone, right? So is that, is that like reasonably easy to see for the people in the back? Kinda. I see heads nodding yes, but like that's kinda hard for me to see. Um, but we'll do the best we can. So uh, on the left side is like, where all the, the options are and, and things that you can control. This is like the team dashboard, which is what you see when you first log in. It kind of gives you an idea of like what you're working on in that given week. So we have like active engagement, which is assessments that you're doing for a product, um, things that you've like found and closed. And of course, like I haven't closed anything because I'm lazy. This is actually just a test instance. So, um, but yeah, so thinking of our model, the first thing we would do is come into the, the product type section, which is under products, and we created a, a product type called uh, G Suite, which is right here. And so if you're adding, why is this not fitting? If you're adding a new one, you would just click this button, add product type. 
very simple. You'd specify, let's see if we get that a little bigger and fit it in. You'd specify, is it a critical product, is it a key product? And then you would move on to the actual product section to create our, our Google Docs product, which is right here. Again, top right to add things, reoccurring theme if you get lost or something. Uh, anyway, so we create this new product. You specify information like uh, who owns it. I'll just try and edit it real quick. So you specify like who owns it, who's responsible for it, what product line does it belong to, and then authorized users is for people that are outside your security team. So people that you don't want to give full access to, but you want them to be able to see the, the assessments because, for instance, they're, they're developers that are working on the product. That's what authorized users is for. And then, right, okay, so we create an engagement that's titled PCI scanning because we want to do an audit before we bring our QSA in and, and spend a lot of money on that. And so all an engagement has is what you're doing, a uh, little information about it, target start and target end date, who's responsible, and then, yeah, so at this point we add our tests. And so I, I think one of the, the things that I utilize the most is we have this text, test section down here that's a little uh, blown up. But so how you actually integrate your tools is you click this little drop down and you say, I want to import something. Um, I'm going to be using like a, a zap scan just to show you. So uh, these active and verified check marks are for if you already trust the results. But typically, I, I bring things in first, and then I go decide whether or not they're false positives. So I'm not going to, actually, I am going to bring things in as active and verified, just so they show up in metrics. But typically, that's a bad idea, just for uh, the record. And so uh, all I'm uploading is zap output as XML, essentially. So I, I told zap I wanted XML output. This is what it gave me. Now I'm just uploading it. And so now all the things that zap found are now in Defect Dojo. And so going back to the engagement level, if we clicked this drop down here, there is a report feature which would pull out not just things from Zap, but also all the other findings reported from all the other tools that you've been using to test. And so another nifty thing that I use a lot. Yes, we, we use the mic, please, so everyone can hear you. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta stand, sorry. So I see that you are scan you you um, imported one XML file. Yes. And you feed that XML file to the product. So each and every time, say biweekly, the check marks or any other tool they will run automatically. So these tasks that what you did manually, so you, you will do each and every week manually, or it is automated. So if you were to use the API, you can do it in an automated fashion. That's kind of our, our last mile of automation we have to do to produce like this report that combines all the tools uh, through the UI. So we want to make all the scanners we support manageable from the UI. So uh, like that includes like scan scheduling, manipulation options, et cetera. That doesn't exist today. That's the last thing we need to write to make it completely okay. automated. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Uh, so the other thing that I use a lot is, so I'm in the actual Zap scan. Sometimes I just want to re-upload it and essentially diff it and automatically close anything that's changed. And so you can do that just by selecting re-upload scan. It takes you back to the same screen. You fill it out again, and it will uh, automatically close anything that's been fixed since the original scan. Yeah, so going back to like the reports and how they're generated, there's also like a filter. If you want to filter out things before you generate the report, you can include finding images. There's also a manual report builder. So let's say that you're not really liking this. You can instead go to this, uh, it's kind of hard to see it because I zoom out, this drag and drop sort of menu. So you can include like cover page findings, you know, vulnerable endpoints, et cetera. But yeah, so when you're ready, you click Generate Report, 
and uh, hopefully it runs. Fingers crossed. I'm gonna come back to that. Uh, so critical metrics, I was told that someone wanted gauges, so we created these sort of like, oh sorry, go ahead, yes. Uh, it's okay, I was just wondering real quick, I know that, I know you're just doing a demo, so it may, you, you could have issues, but in your real life environments, you mentioned there's quite a few companies running this. Is it handling a lot of data well? Yeah, yeah, so uh, I, I did help someone with their install, and they had like in the order of magnitude of 500,000 plus findings. And the longest load time we had, I think, was three seconds. But they had a fairly beefy server. I mean, it wasn't like massive. It was, I think, six cores maybe and like 12 gigs of RAM, so nothing. But the code itself massive. handles a lot of nodes, a lot of data without failing out? Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, you shouldn't hit like any sort of like processing errors where it times out. Uh, from what we found, like the, so typically when you run it in production, you'll front it with like Nginx or Apache or something else. Typically, uh, like the max body size specified by Nginx will become like an issue before the actual application starts falling over. But it's not perfect. Like may, maybe you will find something. And if you do, that's awesome because then we can fix it, hopefully. Yes, Tanya. Mine's kind of related. So imagine um, we had a bunch of different uh, mini companies or departments that were all running their own defect dojo, then could we put them all into like a master one? Would we be able to like export the stuff and then all put, or would we have to put it into ours and then put it into theirs? Or could it like kind of suck it? No, I, I get what you're asking. Great question. Um, yes, so one thing we're doing right now at, at Pearson is we combine the results of, of of our testing with our IDS uh, alerts and Splunk to make our, our alerts smarter. So uh, imagine, if you will, that you see someone just throwing like a, a Windows vulnerability on a Linux system. Probably no one should be woken up in the middle of the night. But if you see an SQL injection attempt against an app that you know that's vulnerable, then like it's probably time to wake me up in the middle of the night, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but so to that point, it, it's very easy to like export data. So if you had like many instances and then you wanted to funnel it up to the mothership, I think you could do that in a script that would maybe be like 10 lines max. Yeah, cool, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our metrics page, basically it has every metric under the sun that I can think of. So like life through time metrics, there is a wall of shame at the bottom who tells you like who has the most vulnerabilities. Uh, you can like look at the age of issues. You can look at, how are we doing on time? We're getting close. Oh shoot. Okay, uh, so you can look at vulnerable endpoints. I'm just gonna make sure this report actually finished. Yeah, so just a test instance, so a tiny bit slow. Download, report, right? So everyone is producing the same type of report. Everything's standardized, so like a branding perspective for your team. Everything looks the same. No one has to write anything. Everyone's happy. Rob, did you have a question? Yes. Okay, yes. go ahead. Well, okay, I real quick, yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I, I don't know if you, you covered this or if you, or you, or, or you've mentioned it, I might have uh, blinked out a little bit. But anyways, the, um, the question I wanted to see um, as far as your roadmap for Defect Dojo and, um, and more particularly, are you looking at, you know, uh, doing more correlation of the data, being that you're coming from multiple sources in the future? Yes. Uh, so. Let, let me get to that in just a minute. Uh, okay. So everyone, I'm sorry that I'm running out of time. There's a, a live demo site if you feel like playing around with it yourself. Uh, I also have like all these animated GIFs of like all the features. So um, this won't show in, in like the, the actual OWASP slides because it, it, it's PDF, so I don't think it'll have animated GIFs. But um, I'll, I'll figure out a way to share this if you want to go back and look. There's a team calendar. So it's not just intended for security engineers. There's also the ability for managers to get what they need out of it and up if you're interested on like how your team's doing, et cetera. Oh, we have 10. Is that like 10 plus Q&A or, or 10 total? Got it, okay. Okay, Jira integration, wanna to touch on this really quick. So uh, what I found is when you can push issues to where developers naturally work, on average, they interacted with it nine more times. And so if we just generated a vulnerability report and threw it over the fence, uh, the, the developers looked at it typically two times max. 
But if we pushed it into their backlog, on average they looked at it nine times and ended up fixing it. Our JIRA integration is completely bidirectional. So if you close something in JIRA, it'll close in Defect Dojo. If you make a comment in Defect Dojo, the comment will show up in JIRA and vice versa. You comment in JIRA, it'll show up in Defect Dojo. That took a lot of work. That was a lot of work. Anyway, this is a nightmare. Um, the last thing I, I really want to touch on about the tool itself is the, the system settings because there's uh, some things there to do sort of like smart things inside the tools, but there's also like some pitfalls. Uh, so the first one is deduplication. And the idea behind deduplication is, I'm just using dynamic scanners as an example. You could also use uh, static analysis. Works exactly the same. So you have two dynamic tools that are essentially testing for the same things, but you're using them to increase your coverage because maybe Zap is better at finding things, certain issues and Arachne is, is better at finding others. But there's also sort of this middle of shared issues that you don't want to include in metrics and reporting because uh, they're the exact same. So deduplication tries to automatically remove those for you. And so it's just one of the, the checkboxes in the settings. And uh, what it compares is if the endpoint is the same, the title or the CWE is the same, and it's in the same product, it will automatically mark the oldest one as a duplicate. Uh, false positive history. So the same concept, it's a, a checkbox in the system settings. And what false positive history does is if it's the same title or CWE, it's the same product, and it's the exact same tool, it will go ahead and mark a finding as a false positive. So if you think of a, a, like a certain scanner as having like really robust output and you're tired of seeing the same thing that's false over and over again, this will automatically mark it as a false positive. Now the risk here is that this actually becomes an issue in the future and it automatically gets marked because uh, for whatever reason, I think that's a really, really small edge case. I've, I've never seen like one of those, uh, I mean, you guys have seen them, these very like obscure, strange issues. You get like an Apache error and you're not even running Apache or like from like one of your vulnerability scanners. That's part of the endpoint. So it has to be, yeah, so it has to be like in the exact same spot, which is something I left off here. But great point. I'm very glad you're keeping me honest and paying attention. Um, yeah, so trying it out, it, it's three lines to get to the same instance that, that I was running right there. You clone it, go into the directory, run the setup script, and run the server. Uh, the future, so we already talked about, we want to produce this tool that allows you to get a high confidence report without any human interaction to stretch your security resources. Uh, contributing, the project has absolutely ballooned uh, and it's, it's been a little hard for our, uh, our, our team to keep up with, our, our team that helps me uh, review pull requests, et cetera. But so if you're interested at all, you know, it doesn't take very much coding or, or Python experience to get started. And we could really, really use the help to make this a reality. Uh, 1.2, so today, like hours ago, if you're paying close attention and keeping me honest, last night, um, I cut our 1.2 release, so it's our, you know, our newest version, our stable version. I was going to include the change log, but it would have taken like four slides, and no one wants to see that. References, so if you go back and look at this, there's the docs, there's the demo, et cetera, everything you need. And uh, I also just want to mention really quickly that I am running for the board at OWASP. Uh, at this point in my career with OWASP, I've, I've done everything but be a, a staff member. I think I have a really great understanding of the org and I would love to work with you guys to make the organization better and work better for, for everyone. And so uh, here's a short URL if you're interested in that information. And of course, the security professionals, you can go unshorten it before you look at it, but it's just a LinkedIn article with all that information, if that's something that's relevant to you or you're interested in. And then that's it, guys. Thank you so much. I'll take any questions you have. If you think of anything else later, here's my email. I'm just greg.anderson at oas.org. And thank you again for coming. Yes. Hi. Um, I've got a quick question. So um, great work. I'm a big fan of Traffic Dojo already. Uh, so what can I do for my existing findings, which are already in another defect tracking system, and I want them to be moved here? Great question. So before I forget, I don't think I messed up my demo. So if anyone wants stickers, you can just like come up and grab them. Um, yes, so that, that's a challenge. I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, you would have to write something that like dumps the database in the back end and then like converts it over 
if that makes sense. So uh, that, that's something I've had to do a couple times. If you send me an email, I'll give you the scripts I already have for that if it's, if it's a tool that I've already worked with, if that makes sense. But okay. yeah, you'd have to get the data and then uh, import in some way. So you could just write a Python script that pushes it directly into the database. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to go about it depending on um, what tool it's using and, and how much autonomy you have to manipulate it, if that makes sense. Sure, okay, thank you. Thanks. Hey, I've got a question about metrics. I know you may hate metrics, but um, sometimes metrics is extremely uh, important for big organizations because you get a lot of money from business people, right? After one or two years, they come back to ask you, show me your value, right? I give you $1 million, show me your value. Then if you do not have a good metrics, for example, like what are the top 10 vulnerabilities in my portfolio? What are the top 10 vulnerabilities in my application? Or, you know, what is the average time actually it takes you know, to fix a, a bug, then if you don't have that kind of information, it's hard actually to defend the value of application security team. So in, in that case, you know, what's your thought on this? Great question. So in regards to actual testing metrics, everything you mentioned is, is there. So like age of issues, what types of issues are we finding, et cetera? Are we finding more or less? You can even like compare tools if you want to. If you, let's say you had like two trials for two commercial tools and you want to figure out which one is better for your org, some of the metrics in there will help you do like a bake off to determine which one is better. Uh, but I, I think this is kind of a larger problem in our industry of quantifying the value in security. And so uh, something that I want to add at some point is the ability to take the information that's in IDS to figure out like what type of attacks we're seeing and then compare it to our vulnerability data and see if we've ever been vulnerable. Because then it's reasonable to assume that that exploit might have been successful. And then if we can price that information that would have been lost, then we can actually put a value on the AppSec team and what they're producing. Because I think the other problem security faces from a budget perspective is that unless you're a revenue generating team, you're kind of always going to be second to whoever is revenue generating. But as we all know, security needs to be a first priority for a company. So that's one of the hopes I have to try and solve that. But I think that's, that's a tough problem that we all face in the industry. So yes, metrics need to do more, though, at the same time to, to summarize. Great question. Thank, Thank you. Um, I was wondering what your API is, because I know you've mentioned that there is an API, but, you, but you've kind of mentioned just even with that last one that you might have to write Python script. It sounds like maybe even something that would have to run locally. So I mean, is there like a REST API or something like that? There, there is a REST API. We use uh, TastyPy to create that. Honestly, it is not the best API, to be totally honest with you. It's something that we do want to overhaul. It is usable, but you'll probably end up cursing at it. There is a, a Python library to abstract you away from the API that Aaron Weaver wrote. Um, and so that, that's what I'd recommend for using the API right now, is download the Python library and, and let that communicate with it. And so, then also um, for other systems, like the one that we we're using right now, there's the idea of getting plugins and stuff for it. So like one of the plugins that I know we've started working with is the issue library, where you can actually put in custom tagging and things or being able to store changes made to issues. Does, Dojo, does Defect Dojo handle if I want to customize an issue and have it remember that issue for the future? Like so scoring in, in and Defect stuff? Dojo, one of the things we didn't have time to show was this notion of templating. So imagine that you find like cross-site scripting over and over again, and you're, you're tired of writing like how to fix it and the references. You can look at it as a blessed finding or a template, and then you can just click a button to reuse that information if you so choose. Okay. Does that kind of answer your question? The other thing I, I should mention uh, is I just want to thank uh, Patrick Norton. Sorry if I'm messing up your last name or, or if you're even here, he wrote our integration to add Slack and HipChat notifications, so you can also like push out how testing is going to, to slap in Slack and HipChat now, thanks to him. Um, that was a lot of work, and I really, really didn't want to do it. So thank you, Patrick, if you're watching this. Uh, any other questions? Anything else I can answer for anyone? Great, awesome. Thank you so much for coming again, guys. Really appreciate it.